And I said, um, well, there's several problems with that idea. Number one, I don't think I have enough ideas to write, so that's a huge problem. Uh, secondly, I've never done this before, so I have no idea what you're asking me to do. And thirdly, I have two jobs, so I have no time to actually do this. And to, uh, to make a long, boring story short, after I quit desk with no plan, um, the editor called me up and said, okay, time to write the book now. So he put me on a pretty short it got written in the course of the last year and will be published by Burkhauser in August. And really what a what what it what it really in the meantime I, I got another job because I think I just got tired of having me around the house. Um, I, I just took the a job a role as the new associate dean at the architecture school where I had been a part time faculty member a few one years and now I'm learning that even though I've been there for 30, teaching there for 30 years, I had absolutely no idea what was actually going on because now I'm responsible for about half of it. So we're going to figure that out. Um, this discussion today, um, since I've never written a book, I've actually never given a book talk. So I have no idea how this is going to go. But I put together all a, a set of kind of brand new images here. And what you're going to see, rather than a... Um, those of you who've seen me speak before know that I tend to want to focus on one or two issues. This is going to be a complete version of that. I'm going to, we're going to take a kind of speed tour through this, um, through the book using the contents as a kind of guide. Um, the, the, the real reason I did this was I, um, over the course of my career, have really spent my time thinking about three questions. And I, one of the things I had to do when I took this job as an academic is I had to update my CV, which means I had to go back into ancient history, pulling out old resumes and seeing things that I did when I like was young and had hair and had young children. And the, the kinds of issues that I've been thinking about, turns out by design or coincidence have been pretty consistent. I've been, I've been working on really three questions, one, what are the systems that we work in in the building industry to deliver buildings? What are the, what's the relationship between all the players? Two, what is the effect of technology on how the players kind of interact with one another, particularly through the lens of, of architects? And thirdly, what, what, are the, what are the resulting implications for business models? You know, I think there's a tendency to isolate those questions as individual uh, vectors of exploration without really realizing what their relationships are. And that the kinds of, for example, possibilities that technology makes uh, or creates um, in the building industry can't be actuated unless they are connected to other kinds of ideas about how the agency of players work in the systems and frankly, how value is converted. And I'm teaching a course this this semester. Um, we, we just met earlier today, uh, called "New Value Propositions for Practice," and my students are exploring questions of how the work of the building industry. They're asking questions why the systems of business in the building industry convert value so poorly. In other words, buildings are very very important. The people who work in are highly trained. It's extremely risky. It's a, it's a risky proposition. It's, the buildings deliver tremendous amounts of social value, but somehow the value never gets converted to the players. You know, profit margins for all the different people who raised their hands earlier today are not commensurate with the value that we actually deliver. So this, this, um, this book is an attempt to explore the intersection of those questions, primarily to see if I could coherently um, if I could um, transcribe all the stuff that I've been thinking about, and then other people can decide whether it makes sense. So the graphic designers just started, and, the, and I just wanted to show you, show you the basic uh, structure of the idea. The, the, the thinking here is really organized in three categories. The first is called agency, which is what is it that digital, what, what is it about the digitization of the building industry in what way has that changed the way we operate as architects, engineers, 
and contractors. And so the second big section is about methodology, which is what are the implications for the particular procedures of the way we actually work in those systems that have changed? And then the third topic is value, which is, okay, if we have these, we have this uh, technological weaponry and we have some ways of thinking about how we might restructure our business arrangements, what are the strategies for converting value? And so that's the, that's the structure of the overall argument. And the way I've tried to lay it out, uh, which I'll touch on just very lightly tonight, is both uh, historical and projective. Like, how do we get to this particular place we happen to be, whether we're talking about the evolution of CAD to BIM or lump sum fees to value, uh, uh, value fees or old methods of project delivery to new methods of project delivery, looking at those um, historically, and then speculating a little bit about where things might go in the future. So um, I thought rather than make dramatic readings from the text, I would just kind of give you an overview of the, of the argument. So I, I started out by um, trying to situate my, my own thinking about technology in practice. Um, this is one of the AutoCAD projects that we did in Mr. Pelly's office. We had just bought um, 25 or 30 AutoCAD stations when I joined Caesar's office in 1989, and we were super psyched about them. A, because we had spent a fortune on them. I think every, we had to take it alone. I think every station with the software was like $25,000, which in 2018 dollars is what, Pierce? $80,000? I mean, it was like buying a bunch, it was like buying a fleet of cars and parking them in your studio. And Caesar, God bless him, his first reaction to this was, please try all the computers look the same. All the CPUs and the monitors to all be exactly the same. So we thought, okay, now we're, I mean, we, we got very, very excited about this. And the very first project we attempted actually would not have been possible without AutoCAD. This is a laboratory building at the Yale Medical School called the Boyer Center, and it was on a very, very tough curving site. And those of you who do lab work know that labs and curves don't get along very well unless you have a lot of control over the geometry. So we're like, psych, we can use AutoCAD to do this. We can draw these curves. We can squeeze these lab, this lab in. We did this job full service. So we're doing the working drawings, and, and we were starting to build our CAD capabilities and starting to really understand what it meant to be able to use these kind of tools. But it got really interesting fast for, for two reasons. Anybody around during the early days of AutoCAD when you had to put felt pens in the plotters? We, we eventually realized, it's only, only us old guys are raising our hands, right? We eventually realized that, for example, a complex plan drawing of this building with the pen plotter took 11 hours to plot per sheet, 11 hours per plot. And you had to hire somebody or take one of the members of your team and buy a beer and have them sit by the plotter to make sure that one of the damn pins didn't run out of ink in the middle. So, you know, technology gives, then technology takes away. And then some of you have heard me tell this story about, so we started using this tool to really exploit options. We thought, we, now we have all this facility where we can start studying things. And so we would, we would have these reviews with Caesar and he'd come into the studio and there'd be a wall like the size of this wall. And we'd slather the wall with a million alternatives. I was like, option series one, option series two, option series three. There's like 50 options up there. Caesar walked in one day and he goes, what is, he goes, what is wrong with you people? This, this, this is not what I pay you to do. We spent all this money on all these computers and you're using these computers for the systematic generation of useless alternatives. So think about that. The systematic generation of useless alternatives. And I thought, I mean, I remember this review to my dad. I'm like, ouch, man, that hurt. We just took our fleet of cars that we spent all this money on, and we're not, we, haven't, we have not quite figured out what the possibilities are. And, and, and the possibilities at that point felt endless, but we were, we, we were at a particular historical moment where we were just trying to figure out um, what the technology meant. And, it, and in my view, it was the beginning of a series of, pretty interesting and provocative changes, um, this, particularly in what I call the agency of the various players in the process. And so back in 1990 or 91, I was also doing a lot of work with the AIA trying to figure out 
what these different kinds of project delivery paradigms are. You know, and we were trying to institutionalize ideas like design, bid, build, and CM at risk, and CM agency, and I left design, build off this diagram. Uh, these are a couple of IPD diagrams, but really the question was not so much what could you do with the tool, but how did it change your role in the system that you were involved in to deliver a project? And to me, it's the combination of those two questions that allows us ultimately to get to the, to the big issues. So, oh, and by the way, sorry, I, I meant to also say this. This book is in like, the manuscript's done, but a lot of my diagrams are still in this form, going to the graphic designer. I still do use a fell tip pen periodically. I'm not illustrator competent. So this is gonna be a bizarre mixture of high resolution photographs of finished buildings and weird little sketches that I gave my graphic designer. So I, I'm gonna apologize for the, for the discontinuity. So the first chapter, the, the first chapter in, the, in this section about agency is about how technology is refactoring the, the methodologies of design. And what I, what I put forth in, the, in, this, in this part of the argument was that for a long time, all design, tech, all technologies in the building industry, which is largely under digitized, were about replicating old ways of representation. It was about electrifying the ways that we used to do things. So I, I used to be able to draw, I was a really killer plastic lead on my large draftsman. When I was young and when I was in grad school, I did all my drawings plastic layer on Mylar because it looked like ink and it was cheaper. Those skills completely replaced by AutoCAD didn't really improve my, might have improved my productivity, didn't really improve my design quality. The argument that, that I want to put forth here is that because of the advent of some of these more disruptive technologies, things like big data and the availability of large number of computation cycles, and the ability to store large amounts of information, and the ability to move information around from place to place, we're actually seeing these big paradigm shifts in four categories of the way we work. The first is representation, which is how you actually describe an idea so you can transmit it around the, around the industry. The second is analysis, which is how do you take that idea and evaluate it? And you can now, you can do, you can evaluate an idea computationally now, whereas for a long time, um, one's, um, one's evaluation strategy was largely intuition or by rote table. Like Pierce, I was in John Jacobson's office. Uh, um, John Jacobson is the, the associate dean whose job I'm taking, but he was also my structures professor when I was young. And uh, John also teaches, he teaches in systems integration. So he acts as a structural engineering consultant to our students on their projects. And he's in his office last week with things I hadn't seen in 25 years. He had a scale, a felt tip pen, a calculator, and a steel manual. And he was hand calculating steel members and writing them down in red pen on a blue, on a, a blue line print for his students. And I wanted to, I, I thought to myself, this is like a moment from another era. He could be like using a quill pen and a candle because nobody does analysis that way anymore. It's not, it's not manual. It's all, it's all about algorithms now. That, that's really the shift. Third category is what I call realization, which is the idea that the, um, the strategies of representation, which are about abstraction and interpretation. In other words, you make an abstract diagram of something as an architect, for example, and you give it to a contractor and ask the contractor to interpret it. That, that gap is closing. No, there's the, 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 the space between the representational strategy and the information necessary to actually make the thing is starting to get smaller and smaller. And particularly as construction, it gets automated, that gap's gonna continue to close. And then finally, this stuff doesn't make any sense at all unless there's a, a collaboration backbone that allows it all to be connected. And so when you have these, when you have each of these dimensions of the problem of making a building being shifted by technology, then you ha there have to be methodological shifts that come with that. There have to be changes in the way you design. There have to be changes in the way um, things are iterated. There have to be changes in the way things are evaluated. And my thesis that I tried to put forward here is that this represents an enormous opportunity in the building industry to address some of the things that we've been talking about 
for so many years. Like if somebody shows me one more version of that Paul Teicholtz productivity chart, you know, I'm gonna hurl. Although it, it, I'm sure you guys saw the McKinsey report that came out a few months ago. You know, talk about systematically restating the obvious. That, I mean, that was exactly the same thing. It was just McKinsey doing it, so everybody's taking it seriously and prettier graphs. But it said exactly the same thing. We're under digitized, we don't have good productivity, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, my focus obviously since I am an architect and I teach architects is through the lens of, of, of architecture as a discipline, but the principles here apply, I think, broadly, that we're seeing a big shift in the way the way built artifacts are represented in design. We're seeing a we're going to see a methodological shift in the way they're evaluated. We're going to see uh, a change in the relationship between how those representations unfold and how things actually get built. And the the back the collaborative data backbone that makes that all happen, um, even though it's less um, sexy, is kind of equally important. And so. Um, in chapter 2.2, I, I want to put forth this radical, what, 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 is, what I consider to be a radical shift in the basic idea of the relationship between designing things and making things that originated in the Renaissance, right? In the Renaissance, you had two, this is a whole separate lecture, of course, but that, that I've, some of you may have heard me, heard me talk about before, but in the Renaissance, you had two mental models for how construction worked. You had Brunelleschi, the master builder who controlled everything. And then you had Alberti, who wrote this treatise on, all, on architecture. And Alberti invented this idea that we know today as design intent. Design intent is, I have an idea of how I want this thing to be. My idea is more important than the way that idea gets made. I'm gonna represent my idea of design intent as an abstraction. And then I'm gonna give that abstraction to a builder. And the builder is supposed to, and Alberti's quote, if you read the original, is, you know, build it with perfect fidelity. Uh, sound advice, Mario Carpo translated it this way. Mario Carpo is a colleague of mine at Yale who I think was your, was he teaching when you were there, Pierce? Anyway, he said the, the original, um, Alberti says, sound advice and clear drawings. That's what the, that's what the architect and the engineers are responsible for. Sound advice about how the thing goes together and very clear drawings about how it gets built. How's that working out for us? 500 years later, maybe not so well, right? So, at the, you know, at the other end of the continuum are these, are, are these um, analytical infrastructures that actually allow you to evaluate buildings at a subcomponent level and not just express intent, but actually reason about how they're gonna perform. And so this is a, this is a radical restructuring of the idea of design intent because you no longer guess or use your intuition about how something works. You can actually simulate it. And you can incorporate the, the idea of the simulation in the design strategy itself. So there's, this, there's the evolution of this kind of virtuous loop of insight that's starting to get constructed. And this is, I, I can't emphasize the, how much of a radical shift this represents from the original Renaissance idea, I mean, this enlightenment idea that ideas and physical things are completely separate from one another, which was the one of the original uh, driving ideas of the Enlightenment, right? So um, I think particularly for architects, this has uh, some interesting implications. And I want to thank Pierce for the image up above, which I intend to steal and use in the book. And I want to thank our friends from SOM for the image down below, because they gave me this image in, back in 2006. And it really, during the height of the Revit extravaganza, and it really freaked me out. Um, the image up above is uh, a chunk of one of Pierce's uh, BIM execution plans, where as the design leader, he has a design problem that's not about the building, it's about designing the information infrastructure that makes the project work. So if you've got all this digital stuff blowing around at some kind of very basic level, the idea of competency and the idea of what it means to competently run a project is more than just making technical decisions now. It's about orchestrating a project competently. And so the SOM back in 2007 was kind of struggling with this whole question of how many applications do they have and how many different data flows were they dealing with? And we all talked about that a decade ago under the proxy of this idea of interoperability, but it wasn't interoperability. It was a workflow management problem. It was actually, it wasn't about 
why can't this program read this data? It was, what data does this program need in order to do its job based on data that's coming from this program, which is doing a different job? And back even in, back in, you know, in the early BIM days, and I, one of the reasons I love this diagram is that they have, um, they've called, they've created all these new terms, right? We created this term BIM, and then they created all these new terms, like a sketch information module. What the hell is that? Well, you use digital project. That's what you need to do is a really good, robust sketch is a copy of Katia, right? Um, a building development information model. And, and there's there's tools and all these tools, and you count this up, and there's like 27. There's 27 applications here. And this was 11 or 12 years ago. So my, my, my point is that the idea of competency, uh, uh, professional competency, is going to expand to a concept of, of um, orchestration because of the complex interaction of all these things. Does this make sense to people as a concept? Okay. So um, then I, uh, my editor asked me to make a diversion into the, um, a little bit of extemporizing about what it means to prepare the next generation of digital designers in this case. And, well, and, and the, argument that I, the argument that I made is that there are six kind of uh, technological paradigms that inform the way we have to think about teaching the next generation of designers. And those are about representation or modeling using predictive tools, which I know at least in the way we train architects, we don't train them at all to do that sort of stuff. Um, computation, generative design, using scripts, which is starting to emerge. Managing large blobs of data, which is starting to become an architectural discipline now or should be in the near future. Collaboration strategies. And then ultimately the questions of industrialized building. So, and then I, I speculate a little bit about what that st stuff means. The image on the right is um, is the Yale Building Project, which is a project that our students do. Our first year students do every summer after their first year. Pierce, you did it. I did it a thousand years ago when I was a student. Uh, in this particular case, though, and these people are complete rookies, because of the state of the economy, most of them just have gone straight to school because they didn't have to avoid school. So most of them have zero to no office experience but they design and build, they design a building over the course of a semester and then they build it over the course of the summer. They got an excellent lesson this summer in um, architectural politics because the city gives us a site every year to build a house on, but this is a house for two um, um, homeless families. Uh, from, we're working with a homeless, um, orga a homeless organization, but they couldn't get the site until the end of July and the building had to be done by the end of September. So they had to stra suddenly strategize how to prefabricate the entire building in a warehouse seven miles off campus and then truck the building to the site and assemble it, which was really an interesting exercise to do with a bunch of rookies, intense rookies. And they did it. I mean, they, I mean, they just about killed themselves, but they did it. And they had to reconceptualize using the tools that we had made available to them what their strategy was. And essentially my argument in this here is that there's a series of capabilities, but as teachers, we have to think about what it means to deploy those capabilities in the year 2027 to 2032, because that's when our current students, you know, these are these are the inputs to our current education system, and this is under is when they actually start to become competent architects. So what do you have to what do you have to teach an architect who's reaching fruition, at doing and what I mean by that is doing important things in 10 to 14 years, how, and how, how do you design a pedagogy that, that attacks those problems? And so I simply stipulated that those are the six categories that might be interesting. Um, uh, whether, uh, there's a question of whether or not the control of information in and of itself is a, is a necessary competency. Um, and this is the second diagram that Pierce has provided for me. Um, it, I think it's, it's a speculation about the evolving of building industry professionals to do for process design, I guess is what I want to say. I was trained as an architect to produce things. You say design at this level of resolution, to this level of resolution. Then get it to the 
solution. And you argue with the contractor about the area that was built for the drawing. I finished my argument, Frank, do you have anything here? I know you haven't been involved in any of this. Please, here's my best guess about what you need to build this building. Good luck, I dare you. That's right. My argument is that there, it, the, the definition of a coherent design process is about information integrity. It's not about, it's not entirely about the creation of a built artifact. And so we have to start, and we don't train people to do this stuff in any discipline, architecture, engineering, or construction, to actually orchestrate a coherent information strategy. I argue that, uh, uh, and I don't think this is hubris, but you know, the way we, you know, Pierce is an architect, but he's at Skanska and he was my student and we trained him to use his design skills to solve a very wide range of problems. And this is one of them. I mean, this is a design solution. It's not like a design solution he created in studio when he was at Yale, but it's a design solution. And that, that, cap that, cap that capability is gonna be necessary to actually, um, to actually uh, execute projects. And then finally, we need, and this is a very crude sketch of, a, of an even cruder theory, but we, we're, if, if, my, if, if what I've set forth as the transformations in technology platforms is correct, there's going to be a large paradigmatic shift over the next 20 years in the direction of performance and away from artifacts and, and, and away from the idea of services and products which is the way the building industry works today, right? Clients hire architects to provide services and they hire contractors to make products. And the whole model is gonna to shift to this idea of performance because we now have enough tools that are representationally robust. That we can, and we have compute power and we have the, anal the ability to do analytical, anal analytical uh, evaluation using algorithms that we can now begin to simulate and predict outcomes. And the simulation and prediction of outcomes is going to shift the nature of services. But and right now it's highly isolated, right? Right now you can take a limited amount of information and posit the energy performance of the building. You can take a limited amount of information and posit the cost of the system, not a whole, not a whole building. But the, over time, the the idea of performance comes on understanding the implications of the building on various degrees of axes of investigation. In this case, I've just arbitrarily picked the cost of the project, the project's economic implications, the energy use of the project, the traffic implications, and the embodied carbon of the project, which is a multi problem, depending on what size thing you're looking at. You know, If we're looking at a piece of hardware that we buy in this showroom, that has certain cost and embodied carbon and insulation implications. But at the other scale, it's being manufactured, installed, and used on the planet. And there's a relationship between those things. And so there's going to be a, a need over time to develop these, these kind of interconnected systems of performance in order to understand the implications of these designs. This is a, 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 the, a kind of future speculation, I think, on where things are going and a crude sketch. Lots of scribbling. Right. And so now you're starting to see the evolution of lots of different kinds of methodological shifts. And two of them I think are two of them that I think are really interesting is are um, the emergence of um, various forms of it was called today by the Kieran Timberlake team that did the job at Brown. I had never heard this term before, ECI, early contractor involvement. And then he described it and I said, That's CM that's CM agency, right? This con con contractor's consultant? No, it's ECI, which is basically one version of all these different kinds of ideas where designers and owners and contractors collaborate to work on projects and scenario to try to get them to be successful, which is the current model. So that's one vector. The other vector is I'm increasingly convinced that um, the waterfall strategies that we use to do design and construction, you know, schematic design, we're done. Waterfall, design development, we're done. Waterfall, construction documents. In the software industry, we gave that strategy up 10 years ago because software got too complicated to design that way. And we're using ideas like Agile um, and Scrums 
and uh, uh, technologies like GitHub to manage versioning. And I think you, I believe that if my theory is correct here, you're going to start to see more of those kinds of um, uh, agile strategies for building, design, and construction. So if you think about the way those of you who've worked in a co-location room, think about the way a colo room is organized. It's not organized by discipline, and it's not even organized by building part. It's And it's certainly not organized by firm. It's organized by building solution problem. Yeah, and those those individual clusters are, are, are there are many, I think there are many scrum teams. That's, that's really my argument. Um, so the question therefore becomes if, if we're if you're starting to see these evolutions of, of methodology is does design get better do we actually get any better as designers and this is a place interestingly where I think a lot, some of the work that Patrick Schumacher has done when he's defined the idea of parametricism is really interesting because parametricism there's two ways to think about parametricism or parametric design way a is the way my former boss Dean, Dean Stern Bob Stern used to describe it as parametricism is just the technology of the blobmeisters, right? People making blobby things. You know, Greg Lynn is a blobmeister. You know, uh, Mark Gage is a blobmeister. These people just make blobs. But I think the other the other theory of parametricism is that parametric design is a way of describing a series of constraints which can converge to generate a design. And, and there are they, the Zaha's office is the extreme example of this. And this is a city plan these guys did, which is a convergence of parametric models that they built of things like traffic, carbon, wind, height, occupancy, energy. And they generated their forms. They generated the idea of the city based on these kinds of constraints. And I think it's an early, early, early demonstration with some kind of weird, frankly, results um, of this idea that the the it's a demonstration, at least in my view, that this idea of um, parametric analysis and constraint and evaluation can form a new platform from which we can actually start uh, designing and building stuff. And one of the strategies that uh, that emerges from that is this idea of using uh, generative and computational strategies to explore all potential options. So, you know, the, the way I was trained as a designer was to generate the ideas myself, and the client has to trust that I've explored the problem, you know, reasonably well. But there are now starting to be um, generative strategies that combine ideas like scripting and analysis to come up with ideas that nobody would have thought of before. So this single-wing aircraft that NASA was and Boeing was uh, is experimenting with was the result of a design project they did uh, using a discipline called multidisciplinary optimization, which is where they were looking at, they were generating wing solutions, looking at the offsets between uh, strength and weight and fuel capacity. And they, they built an algorithm that optimized all of those things. And they, and they looked at thousands and thousands of alternatives. And the one that turned out to be the best balance was this airplane as a wing, which nobody had ever thought of before. It's a completely unique kind of solution. And so I, I think what I'm arguing here is that if we start deploying these technologies that we're talking about, the solution space gets bigger. So the good news is you can say to the client, I've, I've systematically generated what I believe to be lots and lots of alternatives, but you still have to exercise your judgment and pick the one that makes sense. Because I guarantee you, that's a cool answer. But for that one cool answer, there are probably 5,000 really, really bad, stupid answers. And an aeronautical engineer is the one who had to do that. So there's a, an obligation to begin developing methodologies that optimize, solve, and select this stuff. And then another dimension of this question goes directly to your earlier comment about means and methods. This means and methods thing, the designer is not responsible for means and methods, comes, it comes straight from Alberti with a brief stop at the AIA documents from the 1920s and then a injection of, of irrational logic in the liability crisis of the 1980s. That's, where, that's how we got to a world where architects and engineers can disabuse themselves of anything related to the logic of construction. But if my theory about these platform technologies is correct, there's, a, a, there's a, a potentially a virtuous loop of understanding and memorializing ideas about 
how things get built and how they operate, which then produces information that can cycle back into the design process. And where you're starting to see that is in some of these hyper self-contained AEC companies like Alloy, who's over in Brooklyn. You guys have seen this building. That building's right next to the Brooklyn Bridge, but you probably don't know who the architects are. And the reason you don't know who the architects are is that they are a completely self-contained entity. They, they're, they're called Alloy Development. They're 18 architects in Brooklyn. They find their own sites. They raise their own money. They design the building. They have a construction management team that builds the building. The two principals are real estate agents. So when you go to their office, the one side of their office is a studio. Then there's a demising wall. And on the other side of the wall is a... Um, is a place where they come in and show you the condo buyers kitchens and bathrooms and stuff. You know, it's a, it's a prototyping space and they sell the units themselves. And then they have a little facilities management group that takes care of them. And they are having tons of fun. They're the happiest architects I've ever met. And they're making a ton of money. They're doing extremely well. They're making a lot of money. And what they've done is what they, what they're doing is building this cycle of insight and the question is, can we use, you know, technological infrastructure to build these self-reinforcing flows? But if we're going to get to a world of, of um, we're going to get to a world where that flow, that flow is about design strategies being informed by the ways of making, we're going to have to go back and unbundle a bunch of the things that have created the delivery models that we have today. So um, on the top, I just kind of threw a couple of images in here. On the top is um, Cesarino's drawing of an ionic capital. I mean, those of you who are uh, those of you who are aware of Vitruvius from his commodity and delight, and Vitruvius kind of laid out the first strategies for how repeatable strategies for how to build stuff. But there were no drawings in Vitruvius's time because you couldn't make drawings in pump and, re and repeat all text. There was no way to print drawings. So all the stuff that you see attributed to Vitruvius is people draw stuff that they read in Vitruvius 100, 200, 300 years later. And so what Cesarino has done here is he's taken the logic that Vitruvius has described in words and made a drawing out of it to build, a, to build an ionic column, which is a kind of weird, you know, post-Roman working drawing or a really weird post-Roman Rhino script, right? Except it resulted in this etching. But that construct on the right, which is the services construction contract, a construct where we try to reconcile aspiration, intention, and, and execution by clients, designers, and builders, is incompatible with this whole idea that logic, construction logic, should inform design in some kind of explicit way. So I made this crude drawing. I don't know if it's going to work, but you know, as an architect, this is how I see a poured in place concrete building, right? I can see in my mind's eye continuous concrete columns that stretch from the footing to the underside of the floor, 25 decks above. And I can see in my mind a beautiful retroplated concrete slab that extends off into infinity. And that's, that's my idea of the thing as an architect. The contractor has to build that thing. That's not how he's seeing it, right? He can see in his mind a pumper truck with it pumping the concrete and a bunch of forms that he's going to have to move around and scaffolding and reinforcing and he sees the he sees the negative building because he has to build the negative building to make the positive building so the question is what does the strategy for making the negative building how does it affect the creation of the positive building the positive image of the building and so right now these early ideas of early contractor involvement or construction manager agent. That's a way of using humans to do this stuff. But we're starting to have the technology now where we can instantiate the, the record of how these things work and the logic of how they work. So if a contractor spends the time to build a, a Revit model of the form work that as a, and builds an algorithm that makes that happen, when I'm testing the idea of a concrete building, I could borrow that algorithm and see if it makes any sense for my building to be concrete. Or whether whether it works. I heard a story recently about a a project, a port in place concrete project, where the siding of the building was such that the cost of of positioning the crane there was a million dollar difference between putting the crane in one place or another relative to the construction sequence. And when the architect was informed that um, that it would they'd save a million dollars if they just 
move the building like six feet to the left, the architect refused. He said, it's not my problem, not my problem. You want, I think the building needs to go right here, not my problem. So th there's one dimension about translation. There's one dimension about the kind of broken relationships. There's one idea about the instantiation of the record. And then um, I have a new faculty colleague, Anna Dyson. You guys know her because she works with SOM um, at, through RPI, but she's now a Yale faculty member. And what I'm starting to work with some of her PhDs now, and they're working on the interesting questions of what the data flows from building performance tell a designer about how a building should actually work. So if this is the back, if, if that's about the intention piece and this is the back end, this is all the front end. And I, I, don't, I still do not understand this diagram, so I can't really explain it, but it has something to do with the embodied energy, which is the, the embodied energy in a flow, uh, the flows of energy in making a building product. So if you're really gonna, if you're really gonna build something, according to Anna, maybe someday she'll actually explain this thing to me, um, you have to understand this entire set of related flows. So this argument is related back to my, my uh, building performance question. And so ultimately, at least in my view, none of this argument is even interesting if it doesn't convert to some kind of new value proposition. Otherwise, it's just toys and contracts, right? It's technological toys and new contracts from the AIA, none of which I've worked on both. They're not in it separately. They're not all that interesting, right? And so this value proposition is, um, I used this slide in class yesterday. Um, this is an article in the UK's Express. Oh gosh, my transfer didn't, I had covered up that really awful woman taking that selfie, I'm sorry, it didn't transfer, ignore that. Anyway, this is a really interesting, I'll cover it. This is a really interesting article. They did a salary survey of people in the construction industry in the UK. And here's what they found out. Plumbers are the most highly paid people building buildings in the UK, followed by electricians, civil engineers, steel fixers, roofers, bricklayers, carpenters, plasterers, plasters, scaffolders, floors, and plant operatives, followed then immediately by architects. I, I find this depressing, you know? I went to school for seven years and then had to work for three more and then had to take an exam for four days straight, 12 hours a day to become a licensed architect. And somebody who goes to that same order in, in England would probably be financially better off to go to 18 months of plumber school. So we have this, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a marker for a broken system where the where the 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 value of the work done by the people who conceptualize the building is is kind of weirdly upside down. So, um, the 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 industry itself largely is extremely sensitive to the economic perturbations of the world because our value propositions are so weak. About because uh, profit margins are so narrow and the and construction capitalization is so commoditized, clients to make decisions about building buildings based on the availability of capital as opposed to the things that buildings can do. And as a consequence, you know, we have this awful seven year oscillation, six to seven year oscillation that occurs. And I saw a study at Arizona State uh, um, a couple of years ago that said that when you plot these when you look at the economy, the building economy, and then you plot profit, profitability of, of AEC firms, AEC firms, the profit of AEC firms begins to drop before the economy goes down, then it drops below the level that the economy is performing, and then it lags the economy coming back up. So the profit curves are all completely shifted. And what that means is it's a hyper commoditized cycle that we're in. Our services, everything that we do in the building industry is all about commodity exchanges. It's not about value. It's not about. Um, it's not really about the meaning of the thing that we do, and we've gotten ourselves to this place because we allow all of the aspects of the building industry to be purchased based on lowest first cost and not based on what the buildings actually do. Buildings do important things. It's hard to make a building, and 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 our performance, as those of you who were recently reminded by reading the um, McKinsey report, remember. You know, we're not, we don't do such a hot job as it is, depending on whose statistics you read. Somewhere between 30 and 60% of every project built in the United States misses its budget and or its schedule. That's like going to the dentist and she says to you, well, 
there's this 55% chance that I'm going to get that cavity filled. But there's a 45% chance that something's going to happen that I can't anticipate, and you're still going to have a cavity, right? It just does. It's 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 it's, it's not. It's not a system that generates value in, in a kind of correct way. So the argument that I'm trying to make here is that um, we have to actually leverage these technologies to create a different kind of value proposition. And the value proposition is tied to making things happen instead of just the commoditized exchange of services. And so, you know, I was um, I was trying to make the point that some of the in infrastructural strategies that we use in the building industry need to change in order for us to get to that particular moment. So I don't know if this sketch is going to work or not. But so I said, okay, let's take the door in this building, right? And let's look at the two ways you can generate information about this door. This this argument should be relatively simple to make to a bunch of sophisticated Revit users. You can either draw that door manually in the seven or eight or nine places that it appears and hope that you get it properly coordinated, or you can create that door as a data object and represent it as a series of reports out of a data object. And if you're gonna do that, and you have that thing as data, there have got to be different kinds of strategies for how you might operate as a designer in that process context. So I worked on a book with a faculty colleague a couple of years ago called Building in the Future, and one of the um, essays was written by a guy named Paulo Tom Basie, who put forward this idea that we need to reform the idea of design to include this broader argument of lots of different things. He called it flexible specialization. He said that our architects in particular are too focused on making objects and the part of the, of the exercise that's about making an object and that there's a bunch of stuff that has to be done to actually make a building and design should be defined as some combination of all those lily pads. And you may think you may have a different theory about what the lily pads are, but the idea is essentially, I think, correct because we now we've built enough um, we've built enough technological infrastructure to make a design process strategy like that actually work. So this is the by the way these these are these are finished diagrams in the book because the graphic designer had to go through one layout one chapter to see how much pain I was going to put her. Through. And so in the in this particular piece, I'm trying if we're gonna if we're gonna have an idea about value conversion, we have to have a theory of values, right? We have to have a theory of what kinds of things happen, what kinds of outcomes we can drive if we're gonna change all these systems. So the the theory here, just in brief, is there's a higher there's a hierarchy of aspirations that buildings have from what I call transactional aspirations, which is can you please finish the drawings on time? Right? Can you just finish the drawings, or can you finish the building on time? To executional aspirations, which is, can we please build the building without a lot of pain and terrible suffering, like change orders and leaks and project safety compromises? Then there are operational values, like, can we please, will the building do X, Y, or Z? Will it use less energy? Will it improve employee retention? Will it uh, reduce the infection rate in hospital operating theaters. And then finally, there are these aspirational values that are about um, making promises about the social role of buildings, right? And, and I don't know, know exactly how this is going to work. I've just tried to create a taxonomy. But, you know, every architect who designs a school believes in her heart that students are going to learn more stuff in this beautiful school that they've designed, right? But how about if you prove it? How about if you actually prove it? And even better, how about if you take part of your fee based on pick your spot where you're comfortable on this values ladder and start taking part of your fee at risk for doing some of these things. And in a pre-digital age or even in a CAD age, you couldn't do that. But in the emergent age of BIM and machine learning and big data and analysis and digital fabrication, you can start to begin to create these new kinds of value propositions. And so um, uh, yesterday in class, I, I, I made this, I, I put forth this proposition that the, this value idea is a two dimensional problem and that it includes, it, it has an X axis. I just showed you one axis of it, but it's actually a two axis problem. 
because in order to make this happen, we need models of delivery that, that commit more people to involvement in the system. So at the lowest level of the ladder are the designers, then the builders, then the clients. And that orange curve that you see there is the value curve. And my students are constantly accusing me of drawing random curves because I like their shapes, but there's no math behind them. So I tried today to have a little bit of math, which was if you look at this uh, um, hierarchy of outcomes, which start with basic blocking and tackling of execution and end with social performance, our clients expect everything on this side of the line to happen, right? That's when no client signs up to build a building and goes, you know, I am really expecting this job to involve lots of arguments between the architect and the contractor, involve lots of change orders, involve lots of labor problems, have material shortages, end up flooded. I mean, whatever, you know, all those fun things that happen on construction sites. No client signs up for that stuff to happen. So the stuff on the left here is just basically table sticks, right? That's what we should be doing to get to some level of competence. But once you get to this side of the equation and you can start doing things like saying, I can reduce the carbon this building produces. I can optimize staff retention. I can reduce your maintenance costs on this project. Uh, or even I can improve employee satisfaction. I can make your patients healthier. That's the stuff that clients build the buildings to do in the first place. We need methodological arguments to try to get to that part of the curve, and that's why the that's why the shape and flex. I have a couple of um, joint MARC MBAs in my class. They're they're at the business school and the architecture school at the same time. They don't let me get away with very much stuff, but I didn't get any complaints about that particular curve. So let me finish with this because this is what I talk about in the conclusion. This is the uh, this is the tunnel. Under the Grand, under Grand Central that's being built. Anybody see this article in the New York Times from last Christmas, right? So um, they discovered this big budget discrepancy while they were building this tunnel. I just want to read you this quote. Okay, this is from the Times article. An accountant discovered this several hundred million dollar discrepancy in the budget uh, when reviewing the budget for the platforms under Grand Central. The budget showed that 900 workers were being paid to dig caverns for the platforms as part of the tunnel connecting the station to Long Island Railroad but the accountant could only identify about 700 jobs that needed to be done, according to the three project supervisors. Officials couldn't find any reason for the other 200 people to be there. Quote, nobody knew what those people were doing and if they were, if they were doing anything, said Michael, I can't pronounce his last name, who was then the head of construction at the MTA and who runs transit in New York. The workers were laid off, he said, but no one figured out how long they'd been employed. All we knew is that they were being paid about $1,000 each every day. So this job, which is relatively straightforward in the sense that it's a labor and equipment conversion into a tunnel, was off by hundreds of millions of dollars. And there were 200 guys on the job site. I don't know if this is a Sopranos thing or what the hell is going on down here in New York, but how you have 200 people on a job and nobody notices is just amazing. I mean, it, to me, I read this, I'm like, this is it. This is the problem. There is, there, no one is, there's tons of money going out the door. Some simple simulation and analysis would have told you what you needed to have happen there. And there's 200 guys down there getting paid $1,000 a day to do nothing, right? So there's this, there's this, it's this essential conceptual challenge that these strategies are designed to overcome. And all I'm trying to do here is build some early theory so we can go out and start experimenting with this stuff. But I thought this was, I, I thought this was insane when I read this article. So, okay, so that's, that's pretty much that. I guess I can, if I haven't bored you to death, I can take some questions. Were you, did you have a question? You look like you're about to raise a hand. You know, wait, let me get my beer. Go ahead. your uh, lectures I saw on YouTube, you, uh, you mentioned that, uh, uh, like, the uh, industries, like, marine architecture and, and Minecraft engineering basically no longer used drawing as a very great. Right. Right. My argument here um, design simulation, analysis and simulation is going to become a huge part of design and construction, and you cannot do analysis and simulation from a drawing. A drawing is an artifact or a report, it's not, it's, it's no longer essential. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Other questions before we go back? Yeah. Maybe because I've already, I have a question began my career in my life. The and me? 
But I have still an immense uh, fascination and respect for the hand drawing. I completely agree. For, for invention, for his own one of design. And I have to be very uh, democratic here. I, I go by your argument. Okay. I think in this arrangement in the world of real estate developers, uh, basically, you can see New York. Yeah, business is closing left and right because of their their uh, uh, analysis. You know, you could have an building on the top of that building, and it's just its mindset is is increasingly taking over architecture. And I wonder whether it's value somehow to that mentality and the design process. Well, I, I, uh, part of my on that one is that no, please. I get to see any building in your design in your, in your presentation, which is ostensibly what these are going to come. And then of course you have the world of existing. Building still will not approve most buildings in which um, you know you don't have to demolish the building to build a, a glass covered box that you can do it. You're gonna try you have to adapt to them to one way or another versus this building, you know. And and that seems that's an intrinsic part of the design process, whether it's you adapting to the existing or adding new, and, and also the issue of simplification. So I don't see how your your analysis addresses those issues. Very important for architecture. I, I do see your your argument in terms of value. Architects are really underpaid, but that's a reflection of the fact that basically just decide this wonderful global economy doesn't exist. Architecture is worthless in my view. Well, I, I first I appreciate the critique, and uh, I didn't really have a chance to cover the entire argument here, and there's a. a, a there is an argument here that explores, that I didn't get into here, and I intentionally didn't show any pictures of buildings, because this is a discussion about uh, methodology and agency. It's not, it's a process discussion. It's not a results discussion. And um, secondly, I disagree with your premise. I think you're, this idea that, the, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be blunt now. I'm really tired of the AIA going through a, every seven year existential crisis that goes something like this. Architects are in trouble. We have to do something about this. If only people loved us because design is wonderful, we would be worth more and people would hire us more and we'd make more money. So let's get some ads on NPR and make some videos and buy some ads in Business Week and nothing ever changes. Nothing ever changes. Forget about the whole developer argument. Let's talk about designing uh, hospitals or museums or other artifacts that actually do stuff. And forget about the stuff that those buildings actually do. Why don't we just improve the basic transactional quality of projects? You can design the most beautiful project that you want. The client also expects it to come in on budget. We as architects are, are systemically unable to do that. It is a deep value failure, in my opinion. The inability to actually execute at the lowest level of my values chain compromises our credibility. And the argument here is that the technologies are starting to emerge that allow, that will empower us to be able to manage those things. And irrespective of your argument about developers, a, a, a second, another dimension that I didn't get into that I did write extensively about is if, if, you, if those of you in the room have not read this book, you should go read this book by Daniel and David Susskind called The Future of the Professions. Those, there are two guys from Oxford that study the relationship between technology and knowledge work. And their proposition, frankly, is that there will be no professions in 20 years. That once you can teach a machine to do something, you can teach a machine to do a whole lot of things. And they have, a, they have an argument about the elimination of lawyers, the elimination of doctors, the elimination of architects. I happen to think that's a really bad hypothesis. I think it would be bad for society and bad for humanity. But to pretend it doesn't exist is, is suicide. It's frankly suicide, and and algorithms in a very near in in a very short period of time. And Robert, you should pontificate about this. There's in in, in within our lifetimes, machine learning algorithms are going to be able to do a whole lot of stuff that we do as architects. Not the important stuff, but a whole lot of stuff. You will not be detailing fire stairs anymore. You will not be doing code analysis. You will not be uh, you will not be coordinating drawings. There's a whole bunch of really banal stuff that you can teach an, arch, uh, an architectural algorithm to do quickly. So what's gonna happen? If we don't get better at a value proposition, 
there are a whole lot of developers out there who just as soon hire an algorithm to do a building. And, 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 and they're doing it already. That's and they're doing it already. I don't think that um, only architects and engineers can take advantage of this. Others and are taking advantage of this. They're already doing it. And if you paid attention to some of the presentations we've had in the last year or so, uh, there were direct examples of non-architectures, non-engineering, non-construction companies uh, developing creating space that we necessarily call an architecture like we're not talking about here, but creating a lot of value for clients and using technology to do so to better, to be faster, and to do add much more value for themselves because they're, they're basically right. developers. developers. Um, and the architects, the engineers, and even the suppliers and, and a lot of other parts of the builders, um, their role is changing radically. And it's, but it's an open game. Any of us can take advantage of it and, and, and lead it or be part of it. Um, and try to control it before it controls us. Control. As I mentioned of the argument that I make in the book about, um, I took a course deals about wicked problems. You know, wicked problems being design problems, or he calls them wicked problems. Peter wrote, it, of course, Riddell's argument. And architecture is a wicked problem. It has an undefined, open-ended proposition. It has an undetermined process and an open-ended result. And so he called the he called those wicked problems. And so I I took a Riddell's argument and extended it and said, okay, well, wicked problems and tame problems, right? The wicked having good ideas, seeing new kinds of solutions, making things work, making things beautiful. Those things will never be done well by computers. But there's a whole class of tame problems that we need to master immediately, and those things will be done by computers and soon, and we better control that before it controls us, and it will control us. Go ahead. Isn't that exactly the future where it's going to be computers are going to be basically taking over something value propositions and value propositions? Or they can, they can assist us in controlling them, yeah. But companies and people who are doing it are non-architects. They're not burdened by all the responsibilities of the architect. The architect has basic Right. Okay. So I, I, I see where you're going with that argument. I mean, I, I need like three hours to go through this whole thing. Cause I, okay. So the, um, under that section about responsible control, I speculate about the following question. The value proposition that you are putting forward is the society's decision to, in, to require humans to take responsibility for the public's health, safety, and wealth. Right. That's at the end of the end of the day. That's why a human architect is at the table with your developer client who would otherwise use an algorithm because some human, this human has to put his seal on a drawing that says, I take responsibility for this. Okay. When all that stuff is computational and building inspectors are replaced with machine learning algorithms, except for the site walking the site part, or maybe, you know, machine vision and machine learning or doing, code calculations and all that kind of boring stuff like is the two hour wall in the right place and is the stair wide enough, that'll all be done by computation. So wh where does that leave us as architects protecting the public's health, safety and welfare? And so what I suggest here is we have two options, either let that stuff get become uh, controlled by algorithms or expand the definition of the public's health, safety and welfare to something that's broader about the role of buildings in society and the built environment. And if we don't take that route, then we're going to be automated out of, if not automated out of existence, radically reduced in numbers. We're not going to be, they're not going to remove that responsibility from us until all that is perfect. It's just kind of like Dry, uh, automate, automated, automated cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe. I'm not sure that's, I'm not, at some point, the economic advantages, let, let, I don't want to get into a whole autonomous car argument here, but the fact that humans in the United States kill each other at the rate of 35,000 per year, and we've had one automated car death from, a, well, two, right? One guy was uh, smoking a joint and watching a movie, and his Tesla drove under a truck, and the other, that woman with the bike out in Phoenix jumped out in the middle of a four-lane highway with a bicycle and got hit by the car. That's two. And during the two years that they've been doing that experiment, we killed each other at the rate of 70,000 people. So where, where's the cost benefit 
analysis there. It's good. It's def it's definitely going to come, right? It's it's definitely going to come. The cities have a vested interest in doing this because they don't want to hire building inspectors. So it'll it I I feel that that will all get worked out. And my argument is, irrespective of the nuances, if the building industry doesn't get out in front of that stuff, we're going to get run over by it. Those calculations have been done by industries I mentioned, and plus also oil industry. Right. The offshore rigs they've been doing that since an early 90s. Right, with much tighter control of the supply chain. Yeah. yeah. So but, but you, sh I mean, you got to read this book. It scared the crap out of me. I was just doing it on background reading for this, and it really, um, I, I, I mean, I was breaking out in a cold sweat. Yeah. Uh, the future of the professions. You can get it on Amazon. Yeah. I think the conversation is partially between far future. I totally agree with you in that respect. But you know, it's not uh, an immediate threat. An immediate threat. I agree. Because you know, it's it's the automation augmentation situation. Automated Monday allow the technology to augment the human. Right. And that is just an evolution of the profession. The profession will evolve. If you, as an individual, as a professional, uh, allow yourself to learn new things and allow these new things to be part of your process, then in a way, you'll be an architect for you know, so long. Just that you'll be doing different things. No, I hope you're right. The people in my lars, you know, thing of the past, and I agree with you too. It's a thing of beauty. No, I, I completely agree with you. I'm, my argument here is that we need some theories for how we control these things because there's a certain inevitability about how this is all going to work. And I, I see this all, I see this argument as an enormous opportunity to improve the role of, of design and architects. And I probably didn't make that point strongly enough as I was speeding through my argument. But I think it's a, I think it's a huge opportunity, a huge opportunity. And um, the... Um, well, things happen more slowly in the building industry than pretty much the rest of the world, but it's starting to happen. I mean, when you see a Japanese uh, investment bank throwing down $900 million on Katera, there's about to be a huge wave of investment in building industry technology, which has not happened up to this point. It's because the McKinsey's of the world have run out of places to throw crazy money, right? Yep. Uh, being able to take this data and actually move it further down the road and be able to, you know, feed it back into your system, mm -hmm. all that, which is, you know, what a lot of these firms are doing. I think that's where uh, some of this machine learning aspects and automation. No, I think you're right. I, uh, that theme, interestingly, of kind of generalized vertical integration, I see in my students. Uh, I mean, the number of my students who've said, I want to go work for an architect who's also a developer. Or I want to go like, uh, or I want to go work for an architect who's also a builder. Like Tom Gluck was in my class last week. You know, they they've institutionalized architect-led design build. He could have hired ten of my students right there. They were salivating because they want more control. They want to be able to control these outcomes. And I'm just saying this is another strategy for outcome control. Yeah, go ahead. You noted that you had some MBAs and architects. Right. In your class also. My joint degree candidates, yeah. yes. Is there, do you notice like particular shift in focus or interest? Obviously, they're going to have certain, you know, areas of interest, but do you see them designing things differently, approaching the process differently, approaching problems differently because they have that other dimension of influence? Well, I think, I, I don't know because I don't see their design work very much, but I think that I would observe in general across all of our students, whether they're MBAs or not, there is a lot less interest. I mean, in, a, in the opposition between social objectives and form making, there's been a huge shift even since Pierce was a student. I mean, when you were, you graduated in 2008, right? And there was still a kind of obsessive focus on, you know, using Rhino to make bizarre objects that rotated in space. And that whole agenda is gone pretty much now. And most of our students 
seem to be interested in larger issues and it gets manifest in different kinds of ways. So some of them want to make stuff, some of them are very interested in social activism, some of them are interested in real estate development, um, a couple of them want to do design related tech startups, but their interest generally is broader. And you know, there's a value proposition problem with our joint MRC MBAs because when they graduate, they want to be architects, but architecture firms don't know what to do with them. And, and they've had a little taste of what it means to live in the MBA world. And then they see those salaries and the vast majority of them disappear and never come back to architecture, which I think is bad. Go ahead. A different, um, I, it's been an, an interesting to be following um, this particular way of uh, line of thinking uh, tonight. Uh, but I'd like to shift uh, for my selfish needs uh, in my firm. And you are a? I work at a multidiscipline engineering architecture okay. firm, about 400 people on Long Island. Um, you're an educator now, okay? Uh, you come out of the technology world. And, and yeah, after 20 years of practicing architecture, yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. yeah. From a curriculum point of view, we'd like to have the graduate architects more knowledgeable about how to use the tools that we need them proficient at. Okay. We're not getting people who know how to use Revit. This is a Revit user group. Here. Right. And when people we're graduating architects who don't know how to use the tools that we need them to be proficient at. Okay. So do you think it's our? I, I'm just going to be provocative because that seems to be the tone of the evening. Um, <laughs> is it my job as an educator to train your folks? My my training institution is that what I'm supposed to do? Am I supposed to train them on software? Yeah, the skills that they need to be productive. Is it so? It's my job to produce very productive people to go to your office. Yes. Okay, maybe. I'm not sure I agree with you, right? I think my job, oh, I, as an ed educator, I feel like my my job is to is to produce people who are going to be competent architects ten years from now, right? And I, I if I have you know, so many, if I have X number of calories to expend in my program, and I'm going to, you're asking me to expend a significant number, number of them, training them on a tool that you need right now, what if that tool is superseded by something else? Is, is that, the, am I, am I, am I prioritizing the right things? No, it's not, it's not a fair argument. We should be arguing, with, we should be arguing over something like energy plus or something more obscure, because in the case of Revit, um, there are two things happening. After almost 20 years now, the, the schools are starting to realize that Revit is actually a useful platform to teach people how buildings actually go together. So actually, my, as much as I'd like to tell you that uh, my students are just studying theory, Pierce is teaching my students how to use Revit because they need it to do the building project and to do, to do other stuff. Um, but the... Um, there is this really interesting question about the school's role in training versus educating. But the other dimension, frankly, these days, I don't know where you're hiring from, but most, a lot of schools, the students realize they can't get a job unless they're Revit capable, so they're demanding to be trained in Revit. I mean, and we, Pierce and I were just talking about this. There were, at Yale, we went through all the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross stages about Revit, right? anger, denial, bargaining, you know, we went through all the stages and, you know, um, we've, we've finally come through the other end where the faculty understand why it's, they're doing it, the students really want it, there's not a lot of resistance anymore, and if, you know, if a penny waste design school like Yale is teaching Revit, you just may be hiring from the wrong places, that's, that's all. The, the question in the back? Yeah. What, oh, sorry, I'm not even watching the clock, sorry. Go ahead. Right. 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 
I agree. Is, is that the last question, Robert? That's the last. I know our hosts are 